Are you looking to get your feet wet in Gen AI on your own terms? Check out our free digital course, Build Your Own Custom GPT by Hatchworks. In the course, we teach you step-by-step -step how to create your own custom GPT so you can start solving some specific problems and use cases in your business with Gen AI. Trust me, you're gonna wow your coworkers and probably even yourself with this new skill. Check out the link in the show notes or visit hatchworks.com to get started. Welcome to Built Right, a podcast by Hatchworks where we help you learn to build the right digital product the right way. In each episode, we'll deconstruct the layers of successful product development, break down popular trends, and offer real advice to help make sure your product is built right. We may not have all the answers, but we've built a lot of digital products across a lot of industries, and we've seen a thing or two. Let's get into it. Welcome, Built Right listeners. Today, I'm joined by Eb Ikone, AVP of Product and Engineering at Cox Automotive. And he's also an accomplished author of the book, Becoming a Leader in Product Development. He's got 20 years of experience in product development and is uh, passionate about fostering joy at work, even as a YouTube channel by the same name. But welcome, Eb, to the show. Thanks for having me, Matt. Glad to be here. Yeah, and a local Atlanta guy. Over at yeah. Cox, uh, where ha where Hatchworks is located as well. Uh, but today we're going to deep dive into what you coined the, the six adaptive leader behaviors um, from your book, becoming a leader in product development. So we're going to go through some of those and like just you know checking out the book. A big thing you kind of hit on it's becoming increasingly challenging for product development leaders to effectively lead as workplace demands continue to increase. Rate of change, as we all know, is getting crazy whether it's technology, society, business, there's a lot of pressure on leaders to ensure their groups are moving in a direction towards a common goal. And this is what some of this stuff's going to start to hit on. Like, how do you become a, an effective leader? But to kick us off, uh, let's let's go into the, the first adaptive leader behavior and kind of give us an overview there. Yeah, sure. So maybe you should, I should set some context for this as well as we go to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, behaviors that we expect leaders who create a situation where adaptation happens often to put in place. And I should give some credit to the, it, there are several individuals whose research I worked on or, or read on to really come up with this, but one of them was uh, Ron Heifetz, who has written a number of books on adaptive leadership and his thoughts and perspectives are were quite insightful. And to a large degree, these behaviors are lifted from his work, but applied specifically in a product um, development sort of context. And like you rightly said, the the challenge today is we have a lot of situations that face us and we go about trying to solve them sort of the wrong way. And so the basis for a lot of this, this adaptive approach is to really recognize that in the workplace, we all have a bunch of challenges. Some challenges are, are really straightforward, but some challenges are not straightforward. They might be wicked problems. They might be paradoxes. They might be situations where we have to balance tensions, right? We want to deliver quickly, but we want to deliver high quality, right? So, and these kinds of challenges or problems just require a different approach. But it, it so happens that uh, for the most part, and I kind of blame, if you will, our academic and institutions for this, we are raised as problem solvers. And so we generally approach every challenge thinking like there is a specific solution and answer to this question and everything becomes a math problem. But there, there are just challenges that are don't lend themselves to that kind of situation. So it's really first identifying that not every situation is a math problem that can be solved. There are problems that we need to dance with. And those problems that we need to dance with, you know, are referred to as adaptive challenges. There are other names for them, but the, in this context, they're referred to adaptive challenges. And then as leaders, our teams need to dance with these problems as we do. And so these are sort of behaviors you as a leader can adopt and encourage that can help your team dance, if you will, with the challenges that confront them. So I, I hope that's co good context before we get into the behaviors. I don't know if you, anything you want to look at there. 
Yeah, no, that's perfect context. I love the, you, you coined it like dancing with the problems. There's like, there's some rhythm to it, right? And I think like, I love how you said too, there's never like one right answer. Like the core, like I'm a strategy nerd. And that's one thing with strategy is there's no perfect strategy. There's no one right strategy. There's multiple strategies you can take. And it's really all about increasing your odds of success with an effective strategy. No, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so let's so let's dump uh, let's jump uh, uh, into the uh, six uh, behaviors that we're looking at here. So the first one is referred to as like getting on the balcony, and that's really just attaining some distance. Um, if you've ever been to a program or a show and you're kind of in the middle of things, you might notice that you don't have a great perspective on what's going on, right? You, you don't necessarily see the forest for the trees. And so getting on the balcony is really creating the space to almost step back and reflect on what's going on and, and happening around you and really not always making decisions in the heat of the battle, if I can use that metaphor, but just attaining some distance and trying to gain some perspective. And I would add that I think it's also important for leaders to not, you know, get on the balcony by themselves all the time. Like find people that that you trust, people that bring maybe a different perspective and have them join you on the balcony, the metaphorical balcony, so that they can kind of give you a perspective of what they're seeing and what they're observing. And as we all know, we all have our, our biases. We all have things that stand out to us that might not stand out to somebody else just because of our experiences, our history and life. So the more we can get diverse perspectives on what's going on, the better that we have, or the better opportunities we have for really identifying what's in front of us and and what we need to go and address. Yeah. So, Ed, let me ask you this. So, you are at Cox Automotive, and for those that are not familiar with Cox, there's Cox Automotive, Cox Communications. Like, there's so many different uh, brands and things within that. So, is there a, like, a, you know, when you're in a large company like that, is there like a balcony using the the metaphor within kind of your specific group. And then there's another balcony that's an even higher level, a kind of strategic one, because all the different groups within Cox, I'm sure, kind of play together. And there's, uh, you know, things that you have to consider throughout. That. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody, everyone as a leader is responsible for a scope. And you need to get on the balcony, you know, that overlays the scope you're responsible for. So my scope is not the scope of Cox Enterprises, so I'm not supposed to get on the balcony and reflect on scope uh, on Cox Enterprises as a whole, but I have a scope within the product development group within Cox Automotive, and my job is to, uh, on occasion with people, take a step back and reflect on what's going on. So leaders at every level in the org, for whatever scope they're assigned to, have to, like, get on the balcony and identify the challenges that are, you know, they have to address and, and lead through for their immediate context. And everybody's supposed to be doing this at every level within the org for sure. Yeah. And it's great context is the, the forest through the trees, which is so difficult. <laughs> I've struggled with that in the past too, you know, trying to get out of the tactical day to day and get to the, like, why am I doing this? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that I was just going to say, and I think that that's why it's important that we get multiple perspectives. You know, sometimes we think as leaders that I, I got to do it alone. I got to figure it out by myself. I need to see the entirety of the forest for the trees when it comes to something uh, re regarding my, my org. And this is where I think the idea of distributed leadership is really important. And this view of leadership is not what a single individual does. It, leadership is actually produced through the interactions of a people on a team. And yes, I might be the designated leader and have certain expectations uh, that are uh, ex expectations that people have of me for sure. But when it comes to leadership as a whole, you know, everyone needs to participate in leadership. And again, getting on the balcony, we should have more people really together. Let's, let's talk about what we're seeing. Let's talk about what we're perceiving as a group. And then that helps us understand how we should go forward. This is, you know, off sites and uh, like, sorry, off sites and things like that. You can 
you kind of think about those things as like tangible examples of when people are trying to get on the balcony, right? One of the challenges sometimes with things like offsites is that people get distracted with pressing emails in the moment. And so they don't give themselves the time to be on the balcony to do that reflection. But when you change your space, when you step out of your normal routine, that's, you know, when you get off the dance floor is kind of a way to think about it. When you're no longer dancing and you get on the balcony to, to watch what's going on, that's, that's what it's like. Yeah, I wish I wish answering email was as fun as dancing, but, <laughs> but no, that's great. I love I love that as a starting point there. So let's let's jump to number two. Yeah, identify adaptive challenges, and I talked a little bit about that in the intro. And it's really making the distinction between what is a challenge that has a straightforward, easy answer. Maybe there's a well known, established pattern and recipe for that for that, uh, that challenge. And really all you need to do is adopt it or maybe go hire an expert who can show you and teach you how to do those things versus the set of challenges that are really um, either paradoxes or ch uh, tensions within the org or require like just wholesale paradigm shifts um, in the way you do things, maybe you had a sales strategy that was one way, but now you want to adopt a new sales strategy. And that's a big change for everybody in the org and adaptive challenges are tricky sometimes because they often require that we make changes to the way we think about the world, to the way we kind of act in the world. There isn't necessarily expertise that we can just go by and apply. And, and just have it work for us. We really need to come up with our own um, our own solutions in that situation. And leaders in that context need to help people understand, like, there are no easy answers here. There are no easy answers here. We all have easy answers. We're all dying for easy answers. But there are no easy answers in this situation. We're going to have to kind of dance our ways and maybe not solve the problem, but be in a continual like engagement with that problem and, and manage it better. Yeah, it's it's that whole idea of shifting your your mental model and our human our own human nature and human behavior like acts against that so many times. But you hit on the topic of paradoxes. I, I love a good paradox. Is there is there any par like a paradox out there that you're like, no, oh, that's that's one that I find the most uh, compelling or interesting that you've you've encountered. Wow. I mean, we deal with paradoxes, you know, every day, like an obvious one, if you're in product development is finding that balance between building the right thing, if you will, like in, in the right way. And we want to get something out as soon as possible, but we also want it to, you know, stand up to scrutiny and be solid and, 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 and have the quality that it needs to have in it. So that's just a very obvious one I think we figure out we deal with in, in product development. Even if you get more tactical, there's always this tension between how much do we need to know before we start versus starting and learning as we go, right? And, you know, if you just start without any kind of trying to understand what you're going after, you waste a lot of time. But then if you spend all this time trying to fully understand what you're going after, you also waste a lot of time because you can't do either. So, Paradoxes show up very tactically. They show up more strategically and more organizationally as well. Yeah, that's good. I like the nod to Bill right there. Build the right solution. There, right. That's right. As well. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Number three. What, what, what's number three? So number three is regulate distress, and this is an interesting one because you know we often view stress as being completely negative, but there's good and healthy stress and. If you, uh, I, I use a sporting metaphor here, or if you are exercising or playing your favorite sport or doing something like that, you know, there's a stress that comes at a certain level if you're doing it. Uh, but because you're enjoying it, you know, we don't recognize it as stress. We generally recognize the stress, negative stress, as being stressful. And the point here is that when you take on adaptive challenges that require changes to mental models, maybe require changes to belief systems, require people learn new ways of doing their job, maybe having to put away tried and uh, true practices that people have developed over the years, 
that can lead to a lot of anxiety. It can lead to a lot of nervousness and then distress interns. So as a leader, you want to make it sure that you just foster an environment where people, it's not like people won't get stressed because what you're doing is a change. So people will be stressed, but you want to regulate that and pay attention to that and be sensitive to that. And, and just recognize that everybody is going through this change probably at a different pace. Like one of the things I tell leaders that I talk to is remember that whenever you're leading a group through the kind of change we're talking about right now, it's quite likely that you've had days, weeks, and months to process it emotionally. So they're behind you. And so I'm always, it surprises me that leaders expect like the people on their team to be right there with them emotionally and forget that they've had time to like deal with the emotions and they need to allow for people to sort of catch up emotionally, if you will, as they try to embrace the new change that's uh, they're about to embark on. Yeah, I want to go deeper there because it's an interesting point. I, I've encountered this too where, to your point, you've been thinking about it for months, you know, talking to other leaders and working through the change and you have this great plan and then you roll it out to the team and they're seeing it for the first time. So they're, they could be blindsided, they could be caught off guard, they could be excited for the change. How do you help foster that in a a uh, positive way to where, because really at the end of the day, it's it's your people that are going to execute the change. And if they're not clear and on board, it's probably not going to be successful. Any, any thoughts on how to make that successful pass from like idea strategy to execution? I really love the, the point that you made there that change only succeeds because the people who have to do the change actually do the change. So my first thought there is, we should always be preparing the conditions for change. And, and what does that mean? Like if people trust you, they know you generally have their best interest. If you follow through on what you say you're going to do, then you're creating an environment in general that is conducive to change. And I think what happens is we often make change exercises very eventful in nature and, and we don't, we just don't have an environment that's like conducive to change. We haven't created organizations where people trust. They believe that what the leadership is doing is generally in the best interest. And when leaders make mistakes, they actually say, hey, I made a mistake. And so people are, for the most part, like suspicious. Like, you know, do they really have our best interests at heart? You know, it's like people walk around thinking about that. And so when a change now shows up, people are already starting from a place of, you know, distrust, as you said, or suspiciousness and wondering uh, what's going on here. So I think as a leader, you know, we need to ask ourselves, what kind of environment am I like just fostering every single day? And then when it comes to the moment where I'm introducing a change to recognize that people are going to respond to this differently, like you said, and I need to give time for people to kind of go through the emotions and that will differ depending on what's going on. Like, look, if it's a change that needs to happen in the next 24 hours, because if we don't make the change or we're going to go out of business, then we're going to have to, you know, like people are going to have to get on board quickly. But if it's a change that's going to be something that's going to go on for a while and we really need people to be engaged, then we need to give people an opportunity to express themselves, remaining firm that we're going to go through this change but also respecting that each individual is probably going to go on the change at a different pace. And also understanding like the change might not be for everybody as well. Like that's the, that's maybe swinging the pendulum too far sometimes where we, we, we feel we need to get everybody on board when you've, when you've done your work to create an environment that's generally trusted and all those other things, and it's time for a change and you've given people the opportunity to express how they feel and kind of work through their emotions. Then if there are people who, you know, that change, you know, I'm big on joy at work. If there are people who that change basically erodes all the joy at work, then you probably even for them want them to find something else to do too. So, yeah, no, that's a great point. I don't know if this is like a good to great reference, but it's like the, the, the main job of a leader, point the bus in the right direction, 
getting the right people on the bus and then getting them on the right seats. Like that, that's such an important piece, especially when you're changing course and doing something, something different. The other thing too, that it, it, it was interesting. You talk about like good stress, like, and just as like a side note, I feel like you need to coin a term for good stress. I feel like stress has such a negative connotation. Like there's gotta be a better word. Cause like you mentioned the the sports example, the same thing with like working out, it's painful in the, in the time but it, it has benefits over that. So we need, we need a new word for it. That's uh, maybe a, it's a tech one. Well, there, there's a <laughs> new word for it. I think I might've mentioned it in the book, okay. but I think it's you stress, you stress or something like that. E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. Generally considered as beneficial stress, but you're right on point that the fact of the matter is, you know how some words are ultimately defined by how they're used in society? Stress is a word that's primarily considered or primarily defined as a negative right now. So while there is a positive version of it, I think you and I both be challenged to get people to <laughs> to take it and adopt it. People, people find it hard to think positively about stress, but there is positive stress. And like you said, working out and enjoying the workout, it's difficult, it's stressful, but it's a beneficial stress. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. All right, let's go to number four. Maintain disciplined attention is probably uh, straightforward. When we're asking ourselves to do things that are different, that are difficult, that challenge our our way of being, uh, it can be hard to keep focus on those things. I don't know if you've been part of uh, initiatives where you're trying to adopt something new and it just it seems like people are not doing it and they're coming up with a whole bunch of reasons why they can't do it. And and so this is exactly what this uh, behavior is about. As a leader, you need to keep pointing people to the work that we have to do. And you, I think it's Edgar Schein that says one of the ways you transmit culture is by signaling what matters most to you when you're a leader. And, you know, there, there are evolutionary explanations for this. There are other kinds of explanations for this, but we know that people look at the leaders in the organization in large degree to a large degree, and then emulate what they're doing. You know, you, you may wonder why this is the case, but it is the case. And so, if my leader, if something's come from on high that we're gonna do X, but I observe that my leader is not paying attention to it, I probably won't pay attention to it, except. I'm very passionate about that thing, right? That's the exception. But when I'm not passionate about the thing or the thing is going to introduce some sh- stress, some negative stress into my life, I'm probably not going to be as uh, attentive to what I need to do. And so a key point here is when we're dancing with these adaptive situations, we need to really uh, keep people focused on the task in front of them, the adaptive work, if you mean. We need to set up the right incentives. We need to talk about it all the time. We need to let them know, help them see that this matters to us and that we want them to stay focused on it. Yeah, and I think I I draw a comparison in marketing and really in leadership like you're talking about. It's that idea of repetition. Uh, And it's tough because like, you know, in, in the marketing side, we may talk about something over and over again and just at about the point where we're just like completely dead tired of talking about it, that's when it's just starting to catch on. It's the same thing in leadership too. And the, I, I think back to previous experiences, you know, people, leaders would keep harping on the same thing over and over again, but that was intentional, right? Because you're kind of signaling to your point, like where the priority is, where the focus is. And it's so critical because you're, you're trying to get a large group of people focused in the same direction. Yeah. Like they say, you know, repetition deepens the impression. And so that's just important. You need to keep talking about it, keep uh, highlighting it, keep tying it back to why it matters for sure. So you repeat it, but you also tie it back to like, this is why this is so important at this time. And if we don't do what we're trying to do here, this is this is how it negatively potentially impacts all of us here. So we need we need to really take this on. And, and I just want to say, like, sometimes um, in, in orgs, we don't want to let people, we don't want to tell the truth, right? We take this kind of parent-child relationship. You know, as a parent, you know, there, there are things you, you don't think your children are mature enough to handle. 
that are important and you, you keep that, that information away from them. And, you know, um, I can totally relate to that as a parent of three kids. There's just information I wouldn't share with my kids at this particular point. But in the workplace, we're not dealing with children. These are mature men and women, many, you know, making big time decisions every single day. And so if their actions can impact negatively or positively the org, I think it's important. Uh, we need to be, it's healthy transparency, but I think too many orgs err on the side of trying to protect their people by not giving them important information they need to know. Mm -hmm. No, that, that one, that one hits in my core. That's a, that's a very good point there. I like that. All right. Number five, give the work back to the people. Hopefully this is a bit self-evident. This is really saying like the adaptive work needs to be done by the people. And uh, you, you hit on this, I think, when you're making the comment that, you know, you need the people who who the change needs to be done by the people ultimately. And so giving the adaptive work back to the people is making sure as a leader in this context, you don't step in and say, hey, I got to make all these changes by myself. In a sense, it's not really practical, but I don't know if you've worked for a, a product uh, micromanaging product person in the past who wants to do everything by themselves. That's just not a scalable approach. People need to have a sense of ownership. This is a part of like almost, you know, be le letting people be citizens in a way, right? Just having people be active in shaping the outcomes that uh, we all desire. So giving the work back to the people Another maybe important nuance here is uh, often leaders think that it's their jobs to, job to come up with the solution and then have other people implement the solution. And there are, kind, there are certain challenges where that might be the case, where it's a, a challenge with a clear technical solution and the leader might be the expert and all they need to do is tell people what to do. But these adaptive challenges many cases there isn't a defined solution and we need to figure it out together and so you want your teams to really own figuring it out together uh, and really taking ownership of the work and not becoming like order takers or just um, following instructions on an instruction sheet yeah y any examples in your past experience whether that's cox or other places where either that you've seen that done effectively or maybe not not so effectively kind of giving the work to the people and where it either worked or didn't yeah i think product development is a great example of this because the whole thing about product development is you're trying to provide a product of some sort that helps somebody do something they want to do right so every product in the world uh, is really an enabler. It helps somebody meet a need of theirs ultimately. Like the product in of itself is not what they desire ultimately. What they desire is something else. And that product, to use a uh, jobs to be done, you know, framing here, enables them to do the job they want to do. But in understanding what the right product is, you know, there are really two kind of big schools out there. We have a school where you have some very senior product people and they make all the decisions on what the product's going to be. And then they have a team that just implements all of their decisions. And that's an example of not giving the work back to the people because a lot of product development is adaptive work. We, we don't know exactly what's needed. We need to talk to people and learn and iterate over what's done. So the great examples that I've seen is leaders who connect their teams with people that have problems, give them all the support, all the resources, all the funding, and say, you own developing and delivering a solution for this customer in this situation. This is your adaptive challenge to own team. I'm here to provide support, provide guidance, provide resources, maybe contribute where it makes sense, but this is yours to own versus I'm going to decide maybe in an ivory tower what the solution is and you're going to implement it yeah so many parallels in the product development space there all right let's finish it up number six number six is protect leadership voices from below 
And um, well, all this is getting to is there are always those individuals in our groups who have uh, uh, dissenting opinions or who say things that might rub people the wrong way. Not that the thing itself is what they're saying is bad. And this is not uh, condoning like people speaking, just not being nice. This is really about people who uh, have unpopular opinions, making it safe for them to do so and giving them airtime as well. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about cognitive diversity or we talk about ver diversity in general and a big ex uh, type of diversity is cognitive diversity. You have people who, um, whenever a new idea comes up, the first thing they see is every reason why you can't implement that idea, right? <laughs> you know, and then you have people, the idea comes up and they see every reason why the idea will work. Uh, if you're in an, an environment that has uh, that has a bias towards like let's get things done, people who kind of press on the brakes and say slow down become unpopular. But you want to ensure as a leader that you allow these people's perspectives to come out because in many cases, in my personal experience, having worked with you know people on both sides, everyone's got something to bring to the table that should be considered and you just don't want to overlook it even if it's unpopular there's often some wisdom in what they're sharing and that you want to take into consideration so that's an important aspect of keeping an environment uh keeping a healthy environment where people are taking on challenges yeah something we've adopted at hatchworks over the past couple of years is uh, you know the, the whole team does what's called like a disc assessment so if you're familiar with like myers-briggs kind of a personality test but what's been beneficial there is i know that you know trent on the team is this type of uh personality versus you know uh, kathleen's this type of personality it just gives uh better enablers for that type of conversation because somebody may be more reserved may need to think about something deeper before voicing an opinion versus somebody else may be like all right i'm i got i got perspective right away and i think too it's like you know I, you mentioned in a previous chat like yeah, we're both self-proclaimed introverts, right? So it's it's giving those other folks the the voices that may be quieter on the team uh, freedom to speak and voice their opinion, and I think that's been an interesting evolution for us at uh, Hatchworks over time. Yeah, I think one technique that I've really come to appreciate over the years that's uh, in the same vein of understanding people's thinking styles, whether it's disc or HBDI or, or some of the other things that are out there today um, is the Bono's six thinking hats. And I don't know if you've heard about it before, but yeah, it's De Bono. He's a, was a great creative thinker, wrote a lot of stuff on, on how groups can work better and how innovation can occur. But he has this idea of, of six thinking hats and I'll just go over them quickly because they're interesting. But the, what, what the six thinking hats do is, to your point, in making it safe for people to 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 raise things, it makes it less about the person and really challenges the group to wear particular hats as they go through a problem. That way, you get an opportunity to hear all the various perspectives. So the the six hats are white, yellow, um, I believe, gray, red, green, and I think blue, if I'm not mistaken. And so. The white hat is really, if I if I remember serves you right, is like just state what the facts are. The yellow hat is all about uh, positive, you know, like the go getters, people who are all about like, yeah, we can make this happen, and give up the reasons why. You know, there's another hat that's all about what are the risks with this. Uh, the red hat's all about emotion. You know, how do you feel about this? The green hat focuses largely on creativity and whatnot and then the blue hat sort of the person who's making sure that if we're all wearing our white hats right now and stating the facts you know that that's what we're doing like no one's wearing a green hat when we should be wearing a white hat so that's another way of if you think about it protecting voices from below by sort of asking everybody to move from maybe their preferred or default thinking approach to uh, different thinking approaches while talking about a problem. 
Okay, when you brought up the colors that that rung a bell, because I do remember, I forget when it was sometime at AT and T in a past life. Um, we were in a room, and I remember like we moved by the colors. It was some kind of exercise that I think was tied to this methodology. So that, that's triggering back some memories now. Uh, I like yeah, that. yeah. I think it should be used more. I'm often in a lot of meetings where I think we'd benefit from uh, using the thinking hats in this meeting because you know. Causing asking people to actually adopt a, a different stance is actually very healthy for us. You know, if if I'm always thinking about the risks associated with things, and that's sort of my default, my go-to, that's natural for me. But maybe what I need to begin to grow is the way I think about opportunity, and kind of putting on that hat can help me develop that part of my uh, my thinking as well. That's perfect. I think that's a great place to to wrap it up there, Eb. So where where can people find you, uh, find your stuff? Where, where's the best place for people to go? Yeah, so uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Ebenezer Ikane. You can find me on there. I'm on Twitter as well, even though Twitter is, uh, or is it X these days? X now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The art- they still got some mixed branding too. So. Yeah, the, ar- the artist formerly known as Twitter is probably what is it. <laughs> You know, so I'm still on X, as you mentioned. I have a YouTube channel called Joy at Work, where, where I uh, talk about experiencing creating joy at work for yourself and with others. And yeah, and then my book, Becoming a Leader Product Developments, on Amazon or Eight Press, and you can get it from there as well. Yeah, the book's great. I encourage everybody to check out the Joy at Work to like nice little tidbits um, tied to your thinking and approach. There are lots of good stuff there. I appreciate well, it. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Matt. It's been fun. Thanks for listening to Built Right. If you enjoy the show, give us a follow or subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to leave us a review. For more info on Built Right, visit us at hatchworksbuiltright.com. Big news, season two of the Built Right Podcast is right around the corner, launching on February 6th. And in this season, we're going all in on generative AI. The guest list is insane, ranging from international AI speakers, founders of Gen AI products, experts in specific domains of Gen AI, and leaders across industries. And we'll even have some Hatrick's own Gen AI leaders as we dig into our generative-driven development methodology. This season isn't just for non-techies, though. Whether you're an AI guru or just AI curious, we're going to bring tactical real-world applications of how you can apply Gen AI in your work and your life that anyone can understand and relate to. And P.S. Gen AI will impact every single industry. So no matter your domain, you need to make sure you set a reminder every other week to listen to the next episode of the Built Right Podcast. While you're waiting for season two, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform so you don't miss an episode. And give us a follow on LinkedIn to join the conversation and give us ideas on specific Gen AI topics you want to hear about. So get ready. Built Right Season 2 Gen AI Edition is coming your way.